And like I said, our friends in the Northeast, typically butane consumption and delivery points for gasoline blending during the winter seasons, a variety of propane consumers throughout Canada for fuel. And then again, we have a variety of applications in the US, but uh, uh, destination again in Mexico and and quite literally we've loaded uh, propane cars in in Canada and unloaded those same cars in Mexico so we're very well connected to our Mexican friends down there and we appreciate the business That's some of our, our coverage Core solutions and services we're really a measurement energy uh, measurement and transfer company uh, we come from the field and we've built up our company with a lot of engineering and expertise and capacity, but we're really a measurement and energy solutions provider. So we do have inventory in stock equipment, whether that be propane, butane related or all refined products. So we do have in, uh, in stock equipment for measurement and transfer systems. We have a strong group of field service technicians that support our installation based on startups and return services uh, throughout North America. We have a variety of uh, product quality systems, whether it be analyzers and testing services and equipment and installation, and then the automation and control systems that go, go with our, uh, our design systems. Some of the product lines that we, we are focused on uh, we're heavily focused on truck transfers, both in and out of all hydrocarbons, uh, refined products, HVP pressurized products, chemicals, and crude oils. Transloading, so rail to truck, rail to bullet. Uh, we're, we're active in the marine space, so ship to truck. So all varieties of transloading, we, we have experience with that in all hydrocarbons. We're also here recently in the past three or four years uh, developing more and more modular terminal systems, so prefabricated systems uh, designed here in Canada, deployed at site, and, uh, and all the support that goes with that. And then more in the upstream space for us is lacking, it's lack systems, so crude oils and condensate pumping and measurement systems and all of the things that go with that, turnkey solutions. Blending systems uh, is another uh, product line that we handle. And that might be uh, anywhere from butane into upstream crudes to heavy oils or oil oil blending and the analytics and support services that go with that. Those are some of the things that we do throughout North America. We're happy to say we moved in in January of this year into a much larger facility, a, a true fabrication facility at 50,000 square feet. And we're able to take on uh, both small and large projects permanent and portable or temporary systems and supporting our modular initiatives. So all of the things that are required to be certified in that be pressure and structural space and the testing and, and fat testing capabilities and flow loop that we do have to support that, the production of those solutions. So if you're ever in the area, please give us a call and uh, recognizing all of our COVID concerns but we're very, very happy to bring people in and, and uh, show, show our facility and our people and our staff off. It's, uh, we're very proud of that. Projects team. So we've evolved over the past uh, five to 10 years in the sense that we're taking on more and more project-based work uh, as required, depending on users. And that along with that brings the professional engineering designations and that, that skill sets, the project managers, the drafting, both process and mechanical and the automation requirements for that. So um, that is the future for us along with all of our packaged goods. So we're, we're pleased to grow that business and participate throughout North America. Quick snapshot should be very typical for most turnkey providers. Uh, the, the project design uh, portion into fabrication in the build, all the QAQC that it goes along with that. And as an extension, we do many factory acceptance tests to assure um, integrity of the product and success at startup. Within the startup phase, we our technicians do go to all of our systems as they're deployed 
and we basically unwrap them, connect and run, and then go through the commissioning and startup process and return services with our clients. And we're very happy to do that. Ongoing support and services, of course, that's where we come from. We come from the field or a technical services side, and uh, that will be the fundamental of our business going forward as well. Snapshots, quick pictures again. Um, in the upstream space, lacks truck offload systems, crude blending. And then in the, the upstream through midstream and downstream markets, the modular terminal designs, whether that be diesel gasolines, propanes, butanes, or crude oils. Uh, with an increased capacity of our, our business, we're able to, to turn around small projects or small facility builds and land them. Stationary gasoline blending systems. So our partner refiner clients in the U.S. and elsewhere are really uh, expanding our skill set, and uh, we really do enjoy where they take us. And uh, gasoline blending, whether that be ethanol, MTBEs, or all of the additive injections is, is a strong part of our business today. Refined fuel transloading, stationary and portable, LPG and butane transloading, stationary and portable, and then of course the jet fuel space for us, or avgas as well. A list of our clients, and of course there's many more, but these are, these are a snapshot here. Well, we're, we should move along here and get on with why we're, we're presenting to you today. And Mitch is going to join me. I grabbed him impromptu, and I think it'll be much better for us to have a bit of a dialogue rather than me just preaching off a PowerPoint. And I think we can get through this information in much better context for you. But I wanted to talk a little bit here about LPG transfers and the measurement of between truck, rail, and bullets. And we'll, we'll work through some of the challenges that we see with our clients as we work go through projects, and hopefully that helps you in your, your initiatives as you uh, carry out your business. A couple of key takeaways that I'd like you to have as we exit this is to really understand, and we found this out as well as we go into the business, uh, LPG and but propanes and butanes, they are a high vapor pressure product that are highly flammable. So there's a higher barrier entry here on the engineering side. You, you, you certainly don't have the forgiveness with some of the more stabilized products with the safety component and the integrity of your equipment, or again, the measurement itself. So in the volumetric measurement of LPGs, um, one thing I can recommend is single phase state, whether that be liquid or gas, that will be uh, ideal. So we'll go into some applications, considerations, and best practices. And then hopefully through the Q&A, we can gather some of your, um, your questions and further the process. So in the na nature of dialogue here, I was just talking to Mitch earlier about this. It's really what we're talking about here in the production phase uh, when we talk about LPGs. But in the production phase, the propanes and butanes are really a byproduct of the NGL, the natural gas liquids out of the, the, the production in the upstream space. And quite quickly in the distribution chain, uh, what happens is the methane and ethanes are pulled off, the dry gas portion is pulled off, and that's really for that fuel component. And where we're going to discuss is what the movements and measurements in the liquid phase, of course, the propane butanes and isobutanes. And there's Further along in this presentation, we'll talk about the, the properties of these and, uh, and why, um, why this would be more in a liquid state than you would be with the methane and ethane. And that all ties into the, the method of transportation, and, and it, which is critical, again, in how we handle, we measure it and handle it, whether that be pumping or metering. And then, as you can see here, as we split off on the C5 plus side. So we have our shale plays up here. So the prolific NGL production that we've got in Western Canada, whether it be Permian or Marcellus and et cetera, we're all dealing with these NGLs more and more. And interesting enough, there's times when we know the spot pricing on propane, is so, so our butane is low, but it's a necessary product of the condensate required for our heavy oil diluents out of Fort McMurray. And, um, and we're all handling that product. Therefore, Canada is a great supply uh, to other areas for consumption of the propane. And we're seeing that with some of the Alta Gas Prince Rupert once they're getting it on the water, 
and the benefit of that propane leaving our country in the pricing point. So I'll leverage some of these fluid properties a little further along, but identifying propane butane and isobutane outside of NGI, I think, is of value. So again, the propane distribution chain. And Mitch, you know, when I look at this, um, we start over here in the, the, uh, the production phase when it's really in an NGL state and it's transported and moved in what call bulk methods, rail being maybe the smallest bulk method, and then we do have our first fractionation or splitting of that off into the propanes and butanes. And what you're going to see through this supply chain here is um, as you get to final user, there's multiple uh, transfers and multiple measurement points along here. And each one of those is going to have its challenges, and hopefully we can shed some light on how we, we approach, uh, approach these different methods along the way. And uh, as you can see, propane is, it could be all the way down to the final retail consumer in small quantities or, or domestic home use or auto, uh, where natural gas, of course, is maybe uh, consumed in larger supplies as a, uh, a power generation product and, and, uh, and all sorts of applications and home use. And along this value chain or distribution chain, when we talk about measurement and metering, we're going to find for a variety of reasons that there's going to be a very high level of measurement required, um, more so maybe on the royalty and then again on the retail side of things where in, in, the, in, the, middle, in the middle areas there's times when it's a contractual measurement where a known buyer and seller um, are maybe uh, more satisfied to have a, a less accurate form of measurement for a variety of reasons. Um, but most certainly we're held by government and regulatory requirements at the final destination of retail with an unknowing party. So the highest level of scrutiny on that transfer and measurement will be to the final retail consumer. And it's very prescriptive uh, methods to do that, and we have some reference to that information further on. So again, just to support the statement that uh, there's, you know, there's a large amount of consumption of these NGL slash chloropanes and butanes for a variety of uses, and I really don't believe that's going away in the near future. Um, electricity, heating, and et cetera, uh, we're going to be consuming these products for years to come, which means companies like ours and yours will be moving it and developing uh, faster, better, more efficient means of doing that. So here's a little snapshot here. I'm sorry, but a little bit of a cloudy picture, but you, you get the, the message here that we're really, the larger volumes in, this, in most situations would be handled on rail inland and then uh, transferred to bullets, potentially, and then to trucks. Now we're going to show that there's times when it might go in between all three of those back and forth before final consumption. We'll try and give some insight, whether that's pumped or other methods, on how to best transfer and measure that, measure that in each situation. But a beautiful looking site here. And another, another significant dis, uh, handling storage and distribution center here that you're seeing, where there's a significant amount of volume being handled and then pumped over for truck filling. So Mitch, typical method is the bulk transfer that we see, and we know that there's a few others out there, with, but we're going to focus on pumped and pressure differential hydraulic. These are something that we're very familiar with and we execute almost on a daily and weekly basis. And I'll get Mitch to jump in as we start checking, uh, talking a little more detail here. But you're seeing examples of all of that. And whether that be bullet to truck, truck to rail, or rail to bullet, the variety of methods are applied here. So Mitch, what we're seeing simply, you know, even in the transport trucks, we're seeing pumps being used. And, you know, when we're moving these products via pump, I believe that the, the method of, uh, of measurement is applied, right? For the most part, you're able to measure that because it stays in the liquid state. Um, some of those advantages, uh, it, it is relatively a low cost solution. Um, the infrastructure of vapor return is not always necessary. 
but the need for a proper NPSH to the pump is required. Yeah, and from our perspective too, as part of the design process, we'll validate that uh, the instrumentation that we select downstream of the transfer point doesn't have any risk of uh, product flashing. There's not a high enough vapor or a pressure drop that you're going to see uh, two-phase flow through a meter that's going to negatively affect your uh, your measurement values. So. Yeah, and at the end of the day, that's critical, right? Is uh, there's two-phase flow, whether that be gas in solution or solution in gas, and you'll see that here in this case, we want the product to be in liquid state. So we're going to do everything we can to keep it there, whether we hold it under pressure, whether we degas at the suction side of a pump. Um, that allows us to do proper measurement, and that allows us to not uh, damage and destroy or prematurely fail our pumping equipment. Um, so those are the primary reasons there on a, on a pumping system. And you know, this is situations where we're, we're pulling out of these bullets for local distribution, as you can see here, these larger bullets into the 30,000 gallon trucks. Then these, you're seeing again here, you're seeing the final bobtails. These bobtails will be filled and they'll go to your local distribution center for filling up. And even, even in your homes, there's certain uh, areas of the country in the Northeast, Northwest of the US where the home heating system their larger vessel at their home is filled by these bobtails, which have onboard metering and pumping systems. Here's a quick snapshot, a little cutaway of a very typical pump. Uh, there's a variety of pump styles, but we'll, we'll, we'll pick on the easy ones first, the, the vein pump. And uh, you're seeing a bit of a split breakaway here. And these are positive displacement pumps, both in portable and stationary formats. Um, and really, Mitch, when we're talking about positive displacement pumps, uh, some of the precautions that we do need to take, and I think we're seeing it here, is, is the, uh, the pressure relief portion of it. Because what if you deadheaded this, this PD pump, what would be happening? Yeah, these, these pumps are especially designed and built for uh, LPG transfer applications. Um, this particular one has an internal liner that will uh, help suppress cavitation and the damages caused by that. One of the things you can't get away from on a highly volatile uh, fluid transfer. Uh, so if you are doing hydraulics and you want to validate your MPSHA versus the MPSHR, um, typically your calculations won't work out in your favor. So um, you have to manage the cavitation. Uh, and the, in this case, like I say, these pumps have specialty components that are designed to to live with the cavitation to some extent. Um, and then, like you mentioned as well. Uh, as it is a PD pump, there has to be some provisions in place for uh, overpressure protection on the downstream side. This particular pump has an internal relief uh, valve that will recycle flow back front to the suction side from the discharge if it exceeds a certain value of differential pressure, which will help protect your downstream side. But for most of our applications, we'll have supplementary overpressure protection uh, measures as well, such as uh, another standalone PSV system or uh, we'll design our, our pipe system to a higher pressure and uh, we can rely on some overpressure protection by system design. Um, and uh, just basically following the best practices of the uh, different pump vendors that we utilize for our systems. Oops, sorry folks. Getting too rambunctious on the uh, technology here. There we go. Um, yeah, and so, you know, best practices, you know, in your piping system design, you certainly uh, in the name of single phase flow and liquid state. There's some really uh, good basic 101 indicators here of how to uh, locate your pump below and, and maximize your NPSH. Um, again, not building gas traps and et cetera, you know, which are examples here. And, and those are some of the things that we'll, we'll do in our system design. And maybe there, again, there might be some mitigation that we can do also for degassing in certain situations. We're seeing a PSP there as well. Yeah, the name of the game when it comes to LPG transfer on both the hydraulic design and the measurement design is, is trying to eliminate vapors if you're trying to measure liquids and transfer liquids and vice versa. So. Yeah. So that being said, LPG metering, very typical for us when we're doing, for instance, a bullet to truck transfer. Uh, that we can meter into that truck. And certain situations, we'll use turbines, uh, or in others, we'll use Coriolis meters. 
um, examples here for you. Um, one vulnerability of a turbine meter, if you do have situations where you have two-phase flow, you could have mechanical damage, um, where the Coriolis meter will be just fine. It'll, it'll have errors, it'll be reading incorrectly, but you won't physically damage the meter. And the other benefit of the Coriolis meter is be that it's a multivariable device is you should have density out of that. Well, you will have density. And I'll show a little further along why density uh, in a LPG transfer is a benefit, whether that be butane or propane. So we've talked a little bit about uh, pumping and, uh, and liquid state. Now we're going to go to more what I described earlier as a pressure differential hydraulic method where we use compressors to, to uh, generate pressure in one vessel to lift, it up, uh, to lift it out of that liquid out of that vessel and transfer it into a receiving vessel. Um, very typical in a rail car application. And you'll see a little further on an example of why, um, why we would use a compressor to lift the liquid propane or butane out of a rail car. And that's really at the end of the day because the connection and the, the point where we get the liquid out of the rail car will be kind of out of the top. And then out of the top, there's an eductor tube that'll, that'll uh, vertically go down to the bottom of the rail car. And we've got to find a way to move that liquid product up. And as you can appreciate, trying to pull propane, uh, a very high vapor pressure product, and pulling that out of inductor tube in liquid form with a pump is, is really not going to be successful. So in that case, you're trying to keep the liquid propane under pressure. Use, I'll go back, I'll reference this little diagram here. So in this situation, I have a deeper uh, description of it. We're using the vapor out of the receiving vessel to compress and displace the liquid volume up and through uh, the adductor tube to the receiving vessel. But I'll go back, we'll get a little more detail on that shortly. So advantages, disadvantages. Um, no, no NPSH issues here. You know, we want we want uh, we want that free vapor gas from the receiving vessel to be used as the driver to the compressor. So therefore, vapor lines are required. Uh, all liquid is transferred. So we're going to remove all of the liquid out of that rail car. Uh, and how do we do that? Well, at the end of the day, that liquid heel that we maybe can't get that all of the seven percent or so or five percent depending on ambient temperature, all of that propane out of that rail car, we're going to go into a vapor recovery mode and depressure that rail car. And in that case, as we depressure, all of that uh, heel volume vaporizes and we'll pull it over. Um, quieter, yeah, probably a little bit more, a little quieter. Uh, and yeah, uh, a little more capital expenditure here, so some expense and, and somewhat more complicated, the compressor systems, because uh, uh, there's a little more complexity to the compressor than there would be a pump. So we talked about those being rail car friendly, and maybe there's situations where you need that vessel empty. So these are very typical application for uh, truck to rail or rail to truck. So again, uh, we've got a basic two throw compressor here, and the connection means, but you're also seeing some of the, the um, controls and things to protect that compressor because the one thing we don't want to do in this situation is pull liquids into the compressor. The compressor and the pistons are built for gas, they're not built for liquid. So in these cases we do capture the liquid and, and deal with it uh, before it hits the compressor. So there's some sophistication around that. Another, here you can see in this situation, be that they're pulling volumes out of the rail cars and filling the bullets, that's going to be happening via these, high, these compressors, and then there will be pumping to fill the trucks. This is a great example uh, of how we execute uh, butane into a rail car or butane out of a rail car. And, and we're using the pressure differential hydraulic in that format, and this is a manifest tro transloading situation, so very easy to deploy. and. Uh, these can be done stationary and permanent, and large facilities are using this as well, permanent. So here's a unique situation. When do I use a pump and a compressor? You know, when is that valid? And I think we, you know, if we have the time, we'll talk about some installations we've done. 
but really, Mitch, why would I be using a compressor and a pump in this situation? Is it a distance issue or what would it cause? What's a good example of that? Yeah, depending on the refined uh, product that you are moving or if it is uh, a more raw NGL, uh, the vapor pressure of the product is going to change as the temperature changes. So in Canada, um, as a good example, as it gets cold, uh, butane vapor pressure uh, gets lower and lower, just the natural phenomenon of LPG. And as it does get lower, the amount of free gases on the, uh, the receipt vessel side go down as well. So the feedstock to the compressor becomes less and less as it gets colder and colder to the point where when you're sitting at a minus 30 or minus 40 degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit um, ambient temperature, the amount of free gas is essentially zero. Uh, and in that case, your compressor is not going to be very efficient at moving product. Uh, if you do look at some of the uh, performance curves of, of the, you know, the popular compressors like Corpin and Black Mirror, you'll see that the transfer rates of LPG go down, well, they go up a lot as the temperature goes down. Um, so what do we do to help speed that up? We, uh, since we have a more free liquid movement, we can add a pump on the system as well to the prime wants to get the system primed with the compressor, the pump will do the rest of the work on the liquid transfer side, and we'll get those transfer rates back up to where they should be. Yeah, so there's a variety of applications where we, we execute this. You're seeing on the right an example of we've done it in a portable fashion, and this is the cold weather butane. So um, rail to truck, truck to rail, we're, we're using a combination of uh, compression and pump, and we're moving N butane at uh, minus 40. In Canada so there's application no doubt and we've done some other applications where the distance is so far that we've needed to boost the vapor space to the receiving vessel on butane so in the name of time I'm going to start moving pretty quickly through here but um, here's two quick snapshots here we're trying to describe the hydraulic process and they really you can go to the cork and black mirror guys uh, YouTube and you'll see this in, in real time uh, videos but the concept here is quite simply, we're going to uh, reduce or pull vapors off of the receiving vessel, compress them through the compressor, and imply them on the vapor space of the rail car. That in turn will lift the liquid propane up and out of the vapor, uh, vapor inductor tube and push it over to the receiving vessel and then uh, and there's your transfer. The reality of that is you're only going to be able to get, depending on your ambient temperatures of your propane, 5 to 7% of that liquid propane out of the rail car. So the solution now to, to pull off the remaining heel, and we're doing this in 50 degrees C in Mexico and other high ambient areas, is we're now going to do a vapor recovery mode where we're flipping the intake to the compressor, and now we're pulling the vapors off of that vessel we're trying to uh, remove the product out of. And we're pulling vapor molecules, if you will, the gaseous state, and then, and then pressing or pumping them into the liquid side or the bottom end side and letting them condense and cool through the propane that's in the receiving vessel. So there's a lot of uh, techniques and methods around doing this efficiently or best case, uh, size of compressor displacement, um, methods of connection and things. So um, uh, this is this is something you're going to want to work with some of your uh, more sophisticated vendors to to execute properly. In this method of hydraulic transfers, we are not measuring Leo for trade. Um, uh, what we end up doing, and I'll and I'll the next slide refers to that, is we we would uh, do a mass measurement, weight and tear, gross and tear of your your truck, your propane truck. Um, your delivery truck and then through the mass measurement determine uh, through density and temperature uh, captured in your at your uh, vessels what the volume was for the mat gross mass if you will so uh, very difficult uh, to to try and execute that properly or legal for trade measurement and in Canada in fact it's not legal for trade because we would have to be deducing the vapor molecules as a liquid equivalent from the liquid transfer. So uh, not legal for trade, but we, we've done installations where we're doing vapor measurement and liquid measurement, and then the, the gas equivalent, or the liquid equivalent in the transfer deduction, but it's really for a contractual basis. And somewhat complicated and expensive, of course. So yeah, best method, 
of, of a hydraulic transfer measurement is to scale your trucks. Uh, very well known and, and well practiced. One other bulk method trans, uh, transfer method that we we run into is uh, what I call drive gas, or really a sweeping gas, and that can be a nitrogen, it could be a natural gas, and these we see maybe in larger facilities, larger infrastructure that have um, a large amount of nitrogen or a large amount of natural gas to be their power gas to push and displace again the LPGs and butanes out of those rail cars. Um, and uh, there's a few advantages and disadvantages to that. Um, typically what we see from a disadvantage point of view is um, when do you know when you, that you've displaced all of that product you're after? Well, you've got to invest in some measurement um, to do it properly, in our opinion. You've got to understand the live density values and try and correlate that with the volumes you're metering out. Um, the next thing that, that could be an issue for you is, is the contamination of that rail car, whether it be nitrogen or some other product. Is there still pressure on that rail car? Does your class one allow you to send your rail car with pressure? Um, if it doesn't, do I, what do I do with that product? Do I vent it? Probably not, be it a hydrocarbon. So now I need to flare it. Well, if I just use nitrogen to displace propane, is that nitrogen going to burn? So there's some challenges around that. Um, but it's a very, uh, you know, if you're using natural gas, of course, it'll burn quite well. But now in the, in the world that we're in, it's not ideal to be burning hydrocarbon uh, at, any, at any point. There's really not a lot of justification for it at times. So, um, but that's an example we do see run into so there's a fair amount of sophistication required um, and it does it can get somewhat difficult if you're trying to move butane in cold weather um, to be executing these at times so considerations we talked about a lot of the rules and we'll go over some of those are the resources to go in and understand those rules and regulations for design building and operating your systems but more so design build from an engineering perspective to measurement obligations, and there's there's uh, requirements for that, all the way through upstream, midstream, and downstream, or distribution and retail. Um, physical properties, we'll refresh there, and components and, equip and equipment. Uh, I talked to one of our projects fellow, and I said, what do people need to know? Uh, because they're executing projects every day, and, and uh, they say, talk about the little things, you know? What are some of the components that are required? Because sometimes people are coming out of a hydrocarbon or a crude oil space and the HVP uh, piping systems and pumping and measurement systems are completely foreign. Um, and some of it's new. So we'll, we'll, go through, we'll go through some of those components here also. Safety regulation industry guidelines. So this is the world that Mitch lives in. These are the, the rules and the Bibles and the things that uh, we, we need to follow. Um, and we work throughout North America, so uh, all the way from NFPA 58, 70 on electrical, CSA here in Canada, um, we've got ASME, we've got NOM. So um, NOM is a, a Mexican entity or a Mexican technical specification. Uh, you can see the specific uh, specification for the petroleum liquid gas, but it's out of the official Mexican standards. Um, and we run into all a variety, but it's typically a mix of the API and North American standards throughout that we execute our projects to. Yeah, it's a mixed bag depending on which uh, local region you're working in. Um, the local government will dictate which standards and specs to adopt and enforce as either the local law or best practices for design. Not only that, but uh, certain clients will also pick up their own specs and standards as well that are a whole other layer on top of what's legally mandated um, that we also need to be aware of when it comes to uh, our system design. Yeah, so this is all, the, it, you know, it's all available and it's, it's actually great reading. It's not, some of it's deep, some of it isn't. So great resources. Measurement regulation industry guidelines when it comes to measurement. Um, measurement Canada here on those legal for trade transactions, API in the US and NIST, and then NOM again in Mexico. So here's a few of the examples for reference. Um, but really at the end of the day, for the most part, I classify it into knowing and non-knowing parties. And if you're in a retail situation, 
You're going to have to have the highest level and most prescriptive form of measurement in your, your regions, uh, whether that be NIST or Measurement Canada. If it's contractual, um, it's really up to those two knowing parties on how they want to handle that maybe more closer to the upstream space of NGL or, or raw mixed bag uh, field propane and butanes. And sometimes people take uh, bill of ladings from other metering points and tank gauging, if you will, or bullet gauging is at what works for them. But that's a contractual issue. And then again, you know, just to, to go through that, you know, we've got the upstream production side, it's transported all the way along and then it's split and transported many times before you get to on the right hand side, again, the retail legal for trade with your highest level of government requirements, mandated and managed and, and uh, inspected and reviewed. Physical properties of not only propane, but the butanes that come along with at times. Um, and they're, they're definitely unique. These, these two commodities are definitely unique. And, and primarily when it comes down to vapor pressure and ambient temperatures. So we talked about why the methane and ethane isn't present for the most part in the propane and butane space and the LPGs as they're in a liquid state generally. And I grabbed a couple of SDSs. Um, and you're going to see here that there could be some butanes in your propane, no doubt about it, and some ethane, small quantities. That's, and the fact that it's actually an extremely flammable gas with a high vapor pressure. Butane, typically N-butane or I-butane, um, but typically N, native. So when we look at the vapor pressure charting here, you can quite quickly see 100% um, propane in the darker blue line on the left and the more, uh, the, the purple line, if you will, in 100% butane. Uh, Mitch, maybe tell me, you know, when I'm looking at ambient temperatures here, uh, for instance, I think I've got the Celsius on the bottom, but at minus 40, where, what are some of the unique differences that strike you or come out right away here on the 100% scale of things? Yeah, we talked on the upstream space about uh, dead fluid and, um, and basically uh, crude oil that doesn't have any vapor pressure. You can almost treat butane in the same manner at cold temperatures. Once you hit that minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, the vapor pressure of butane potentially goes down to zero. Um, and the reason why that's important is, uh, again, on the compression side, it means there's going to be no free vapor to compress and uh, do your liquid transfer. And even on the propane side, it gets difficult as well because uh, vapor pressure sitting at around uh, 20 psi or something is going to mean that um, you don't have a lot of uh, free vapor available to transfer liquid. Um, the general rule of thumb is the lighter the hydrocarbon, the higher the vapor pressure. So that's why on your methanes and ethanes, they're not on this chart, but if they were, the vapor pressure would be even higher than it is on the propane side. And again, as you get heavier on the pentanes, the hexanes, the septanes, et cetera, uh, the vapor pressure is just going to be going down further to the point where you're essentially always dealing with the liquid. Um, and, uh, and the idea of the compressor goes out the window entirely on certain NGLs. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, really, um, you're seeing some of the, the phase diagrams here and how badly does it want to be a liquid versus a gas? Mm -hmm. And um, and how do you handle that and manage it? So we're at about 39 minutes. I'm going to start to move along here so that we've got some time at the end. Um, and a quick fact, fact I wanted to grab here is uh, propane's heavier than water. Well, uh, yeah. yeah, in a gaseous state it is. Yeah, I mean, you talk about specific gravity in the two yeah. phases. Yeah, yeah. it uh, settles at the ground, which makes it even more dangerous. The reason why you can't park a propane uh, fuel vehicle underground parking lot in many places because if there is a leak in there, it will settle. Yeah. yeah. 4.2 pounds, yeah. Okay, components. So let's get the, the, the fun stuff out of the way, these little things. Uh, what are the, what's an ACME connection and why would I have a sight glass? Or what's a globe valve for and a ball valve? I'll start to move through here and you'll see pretty quickly why, but um, we're using different things. Uh, on the left, you're going to see this connection point and these are the ACME fitting connections here. And these are really required for the tire pressure applications. I believe they're brass and, um, you know, material compatibility and, 
and the pressures. Um, we're not using cam lock fittings anymore, guys. Uh, we're up at a 300 ANSI system. Uh, as we know, the thermal expansion and the ambient temperature effects, thermal relief and pressure valves come into effect, right? We have dead legs. We can't have thermal expansion. Your, 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 your system has to be accommodate for that. Um, so I'll go a little further in. You know, and, and some of this understanding of two-phase flow while I'm pumping or, or compressing it, that's why sight glasses are valued to your, your operation through. Yeah, and going back to the brass fittings, uh, the big value on having brass fittings at your connection point is uh, to mitigate any sparking from metal on metal contact. Brass is a uh, non-sparking metal, so there's a safety factor there as well. Excellent. A little uh, generic PNID here, but um, you know we talked about uh, standards and regulations. We've got piping codes, so you can see a break here in the B thirty one three, and then the CSA code. And that'll lead us into why do we have this weird thing called the bulkhead. Um, well, I want to back up just a sec. Well, we'll, we'll the, the excess flow valves, you're seeing examples of excess flow valves here on the trucks and some of those Acme fittings and connections and these smart hoses. So this is our pressurized uh, transport truck now versus our uh, crude haulers, if you will. Higher pressure ratings. Uh, and all of the thermal protection requirement that uh, that will come. So how am I connecting to these trucks and even some of my systems? You're seeing these two liquid lines with red indication. That's uh, that an LPG code. And then the vapor line and a yellow color coding, the Acme fittings. We're seeing the, the uh, actuated valves here. So that, and there's actually, uh, what I call manually auto uh, excess flow valves that are actuated in the bottom of the vessel. And we'll speak to those a little bit further. And these are actually Toto brand valves um, for kind of a quick break as well. You don't typically use those due to the pressure drop. But you're also seeing one component of a smart hose or a breakaway hose, and I've got some information that further. You're seeing here also these, these yellow handle hand valves and really those are so that we can close this line and keep it pressurized once the transfer is done. Um, we've got to close it somewhere because this, this propane wants to leave. So we close it at the, at the hose's end. Yeah, and one thing that's also worth mentioning here is uh, the round handles of those valves. Um, they could be glow valves, they could be ball valves, depending on what the customer specification is. But we do keep even a quarter turn ball valve with a round handle just to eliminate the risk of if that hose is dropped on the ground, that valve potentially opening and uh, releasing fluid. So the round handle is another safety measure that we, uh, we yeah. utilize in design. Absolutely, and I think we're gonna, we're gonna hustle through a few minutes here to get to some questions, but a lot of this now we'll talk about, what are these, what, what's with this little metal pedestal here? Why does this pipe have a collar on it? Why is it threaded? Why do I see this cable connector off this pulley? These ESD valves that are manually operated potentially, there's all justification for this. And these bulkheads are actually NFPA, if you will, and I believe CSA mandated, so that if there is a drive away of a truck, you've got multiple forms of breakaway protection. And that all starts, in this case, with the smart hoses and how no different than a, a gas pump uh, with your vehicle, if you drive away, that hose is going to isolate and not allow that, uh, that product to be released. And under our high thermal expansion and flammability of propane, uh, that's a risk, no different than butane as well. So you're seeing the smart hose as being uh, a, a first mitigating factor. These, these collars or break-off uh, break nipples, if you will, on this uh, engineered and designed bulkhead are designed if there's failure here, that these are going to break off as well. This cable is connected to a manually operated, if you will, in this case, uh, ESD isolation valve that can also be pneumatically operated. Or actually these have a thermal component as well. In a fire case, these valves will, I think it's uh, 212 degree F or 100 degree C, they'll melt the thermal element and close the valve. So there's mandated design components to an LPG or butane or HVP system that are required for safety purposes. 
And this is an example of one of our, our bulkheads that we'll build. And these all have to be designed and validated as well. You're seeing examples. Yeah, the whole idea is that uh, we can predict the failure mechanism if there is a pull away or a fire, and we have multiple provisions in place to isolate the system if that ever happens. Yep, so a little bit more about the smart hoses here. There's internal components to it, uh, whether it be a hose failure on a release, whether it be a pull away. All of those are examples of how we're going to stop release and flow out of, out of, out of the truck or out of our uh, at this, in this situation, it's transloading vessel right at this point. So it's all to mitigate release of product. And then you can see here we have uh, pneumatically actuated valves as well. So a little further on, we've got some examples of how you can remotely shut those valves. Here's an example of a manually operated excess flow valve that would be typical to a truck. And then typical to a bullet, you'll have an internal uh, manual sorry, a tank internal valve. Oh, she's moving on me now. And there we go. Okay, so we've got excess flow valves that actually allow flow, Mitch, but in cases where we have a, a, a break off of something or a line failure, that bullet's not going to deplete all of its product at a certain flow rate if you have that max, that differential. Yeah, the idea is that uh, you can allow flow into and out of the bullet at certain rates, but if it exceeds that rate because of, say, there's a pipe leak downstream and you're leaking product at a higher flow than you normally be consuming the product, this internal excess flow valve will close the system and isolate it and prevent any leakage to uh, the atmosphere. Yeah, and you're, you know, this is labeled incorrectly. This is actually a manual with the handle, but we have pneumatic, automatic, we have manual and, uh, and internal valves as well. So another safety mitigation requirement um, through NFPA and, and CSA is, is static ground mitigation or assurance that you have grounding between your vessels, whether that be trucks and rail cars and bullets. Um, that's one example of uh, these are automated systems. So it's not a matter of you just connecting a cable. You need to prove that there's a connection through an automated system or valves or things won't happen. Pumps won't run, compressors won't run. Again, the emergency shutoff valves, pneumatic, manual, hand or cable, there's an over temperature. So there's layer upon layer and you're going to see, we might have, or we'll have at any, at multiple points of a hose, or, or on transfer systems, we have multiple uh, layers of these ESD valves, whether they be pneumatic or mechanically operated. And it's all in the name of, of managing the release on a failure mode. And these can be hosed, they can be, there's a variety of examples, but you know, why are we using compression and things? Because on a standard uh, DOT 112 type pressurized rail car, you're only connecting to the top of the rail car with eductor uh, lines. You're not connecting to the bottom of that rail car in a pressurized uh, vessel. And here's examples of what's really going on inside of that rail car. Here's your eductor tubes, and that's for pulling the, or pulling the, or pushing in a sense, hydraulically pushing that liquid propane or butane up and out of the rail car. And you'll see that there's no connections to the bottom. And that's really by design. So if there was a, uh, a rail car uh, comes off the tracks, the theory is that we're not going to shear that and release all of the product off the bottom of that rail car. More examples of automated, uh, whether it be wireless radio systems or manual push buttons or even manual hand valves. It's all part of the safety mitigation there. And more of the trucking transfers. So I don't think we're going to go through a project summary here, folks. I think we're going to get, we're probably coming up on our, our uh, 50 minutes or so, and we'll take some questions uh, via the chat line. I think it is. I'll jump out of the PowerPoint here shortly, and we'll try and answer between Mitch and I some of those. Feel free to contact SkyEye at any, any time via um, our website, and et cetera. Um, so some of the things... Uh, from a best practices point of view, uh, know what product you're handling and the risks. There's some differences in between NGL, propanes and butanes, and how are you gonna manage that? Define the application. 
Is this an application where I might be pumping the product with metering as an application where I'm going to use pressure differential, whether that be drive gas or hydraulically? That'll start to point in the direction of what equipment's required and what standards and regulations are to be able to do this safely uh, and efficiently. And that'll lead you towards, okay, can I measure this product uh, with inline metering or am I going to be doing it through a weight system and capturing the temperature and density and doing a calculation or just taking gross mass? Um, and understand your process conditions throughout your design. Um, mitigating two-phase flow. So not only am I protecting my equipment, but I'm the integrity of my measurement is valid as well. So these are all some of the things that we uh, we step our way through and we ever get it whenever we get a new application. Okay, so I want to thank you folks for your time. And uh, I don't think it was too ridiculous on the IT failures here on my part, but uh, we got through the first one. And I know we upset the apple cart by doing a dialogue with Mitch, but I think it's the best way to go here. Um, I'm going to jump out of the PowerPoint and try and get to some questions on the chat line. See what we've got. Yeah, I think we're... Yeah, we've got one of the fellows here is, yes, we are going to share this presentation. Certainly we are. Um, and we will have a short survey as well, try and get some of your feedback on what we can do to improve. Uh, question on Mercaptan. Um, now, Mercaptan for us, we, you know, and I'll tell you, we don't get involved with Mercaptan even uh, in the rail car space. Typically, we're not handling odorized rail cars. What we, we don't typically get involved with is uh, the retail portion, so final sale. And, and it's really at that point, and you saw in some of those pictures where the bullets were going to the bobtails, at that point where the bullets are filling those bobtails, that's when it, that product or that commodity would need to be odorized for commercial retail. And really that would be through a, a dousing additive type system. And no different than the, the distribution product in a nat gas system where you're going to be dousing it as it goes in a final distribution phase. But we do, we do a variety of dousings and additive injection systems for refined products, and I think it would be very similar to the situation. Do you see, I have another question here uh, from Anil. Do you see Coriolis as de facto primary flow meter used for LPG metering? Have you used USM? Um, you know, it, I wouldn't say it's de facto. If I've got propane and butane in a liquid state, and I know it's going to be in a liquid state, maybe that's in my facility um, where it's more of a controlled situation. And a lot of those bobtails, again, are still PD style meters or turbines. Um, I wouldn't say it's de facto. Um, we, we definitely, you know, as measurement guys, love Coriolis meters. It's a multivariable device. They're rugged, but they cost money, right? They cost a little bit more than your more mechanical devices. And um, we haven't used it in USM yet. I know we haven't. I would think more on the larger pipeline infrastructure you would. Cavern projects, yes. So yeah, it's in, it, really at the end of the day for caverns, it's uh, just a stationary installation for us. And uh, depending on the pressure conditions and things, we can go to a pumping system if, as well. Yep, caverns, tube storage, bowl storage. Uh, we would treat it all fairly similar from a process perspective, but yeah, there are some details on cavern on you know, temperatures and stuff that we got to keep in mind with that. Yeah, yeah, we've done some underground tube storage, and uh, and there's some temperature concerns there too at times or distances mm -hmm. typically. So that's where we've used a combination of pump and compression. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate we've got a good number of people still hanging in there with us. I hope I hope you've got a, a little bit of insight into Sky Eye, our company, and we've been able to share some information maybe you didn't have. Um, we'll we'll continue to progress these. Okay. 
In the case of flow meters, can another manufacturer's flow meter be installed if they meet custody transfer accuracy? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we showed you a couple examples of meters. We're not, we're not a brand biased group here. So uh, if the manufacturer's product meets the requirement, the specification of accuracy, et cetera, for the, the, the requirement, there's a long list of brands of uh, Coriolis and turbine meters uh, that are absolutely relevant. Uh, we, we work with a long list of vendors and manufacturers. You're absolutely right. You're welcome, Jermaine. Okay, well, I really appreciate it, everybody. And uh, we look forward to future webinars with a variety of topics in the energy measurement and transfer space that we live in in North America within Sky Eyes World. Uh, refined products, crude hydrocarbon, blending. Um, there'll be a variety of things that we'll, we'll get into over the next coming weeks and months. So look forward to talking to you then. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.